has been mentioned the last couple of weeks, this is the 200th anniversary of the introduction of Silent Night back in 1818 on Christmas Eve. So to give you another little piece of history this morning, the German words for the original six stanzas of the carol we know as Silent Night. Um, was first performed in a church in, Mar in Maria Farr, Austria. And the composer, his grandfather lived nearby, and it's easy to imagine that he could have come up with the words while walking through the countryside on a visit to his grandfather. But the fact is we have no idea if any particular event inspired Joseph Moore to pen the poetic version of the birth of the Christ child. The world is fortunate, however, that he didn't leave it behind when he was transferred to Oberndorf in 1817. Now, Franz Gruber, on December 24th, 1818, Joseph Moore journeyed to the home of the musician school teacher, Gruber, who lived in nearby Arnsdorf. He showed his friend the poem and asked him to add a melody and guitar accompaniment so that it could be sung at midnight mass. His reason for wanting the new carol is unknown. <clears throat> Some speculate that the organ would not work. Others feel that the assistant pastor, who dearly loved guitar music, merely wanted a new Christmas carol for Christmas. When the angels had left them and gone into, into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that had taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child laying in the manger. When the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that was taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, found Mary and Joseph and the child lay in the manger. When they saw this, they, ma they made known that it was, they were told about this child. And all who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all those words and pondered at them in her heart. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn. Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. We continue the season of waiting by lighting the third candle of joy, anticipating the light of the star was shown over Bethlehem for all to see. May we pray? Wondrous God, we open ourselves to hear your call today to become those who might not not only saw the joy around us, but can also be joy to all around us in our lives, in our families, in our communities, and in our world. Amen. Joy. Our sister Joy isn't here to tell us that, you know, she's here. She's recovering from her knee surgery and doing reasonably well. But how much joy do you really have in your life? 
I think I spent a lot of my life without much joy. You know, it's like, okay, it could be worse. You know, my wife and I joke that there's kind of Lutheran earth tones of life uh, taking off on the Garrison Keeler show, talking about the, the dark Lutherans in Minnesota where, you know, you're t saying, well, it's not that bad. But God wants us to experience authentic joy. Not just because it's wonderful, not just because it makes us more alive, sends us all the right endorphins and all that other good stuff inside, but because it flows out of us for others. It changes the world in which we live in. Often these days, joy is supposed to come from wealth and power and putting down others we dislike or fear, generally from smug self-satisfaction. Our consumer culture tells us that if we get certain stuff, we should feel joy. And maybe at this time of the year, if we give certain stuff, then we will feel joy. It doesn't really work, does it? because consumption hasn't have anything to do with joy at all. Joy is often found in people who don't have much of anything in the way of material resources. And often those with incredible amounts of stuff and resources are joyless. Perhaps, as the old saying goes, we've been trying to spell joy with the wrong blocks in the spiritual kindergarten of life. So let's just for a moment remember a moment of joy in your life. Can you come up with one when you really felt joy? What was it like? What was going on? How did it come? Savor that moment. Feel that change within yourself as you remember joy. <clears throat> now the prophet Zephaniah was talking to people who had every reason to be joyless. People who lived in exile. People who had suffered tremendously. People whose lives were hard and got God was saying through Zephaniah, rejoice! Can you imagine how well that was received? They probably looked at him and said, what kind of a nutcase is that? But he tells us that our joy comes from the inbreaking of divine grace into our lives. A grace that sets us free from judgment fear and anxiety, from shame, from inner poverty, from life-threatening and debilitating illness. Grace seems to be about restoring us to right relationship with God, God's good and loving plan for life with God and others. So joy isn't about stuff. Joy is about being restored to that relationship with God. Now, when I was a kid and sort of thought of God as some bearded, white-haired old geezer who was looking and checking out how, what kind of a, a naughty little boy I was, as I was frequently reminded by those around me, rightfully so, of course, but... There wasn't too much excitement about that. There wasn't a lot of joy in that prospect. But God loves us, and God wants us to experience incredible amounts of joy, and that in that relationship is amazing joy. Just imagine that you get to watch the whole universe unfold before you planets and galaxies and life and all sorts of wonderful things, that you're surrounded by love and by beings who love you. Joy. 
finally being connected to everything that is wonderful, a part of God's whole plan. Joy is experiencing the flow of God's grace wiping out to the barriers to life in abundance, grounding us in love and embracing all. It's about a whole community in celebration of love, like after some great suffering. Now, we do live in times of great stress and anxiety and conflict and hatred and division and fear. And joy can seem to be in short supply even if our group wins a battle. Perhaps we could imagine, some of you lived through it, but others imagine the end of World War II and people just acting goofy. People happy. People experiencing joy. Now, they didn't have joy when they won a battle. They experienced joy because finally there was the possibility that the threats of war had stopped. Even for a for short time, life and love were to be rekindled. But the thing is, Christians are supposed to experience joy all the time. All the time to experience God with us all the time so that our joy spreads out as we encounter others. Joy that arises within us when we sense our oneness with God and our oneness with others and the inner barriers fall away. You know those inner barriers that tell you that you're not good enough, right? Right? Of course, most of us think we're the only one that's not good enough a lot of the time. But God says we're not to think that at all. That God's love is for all of us. That you don't have to be good enough. You're invited to know that you are loved. Consider the joy that comes to parents after the birth of a long-anticipated baby now cradled in their arms. The miracle of life, after a long wait, raising up an awareness of the infinite wonder of life, connecting us with the future and perhaps the past. How do we share this wonder and joy with others? You can't bottle it up and buy it or sell it. We live into joy and the sense that we are at one with God and the world as we find active ways to reach out and touch others who as yet are not touched by this wonder and joy because they live a life in fear and shame and brokenness and division. As the person in the movie here told us this morning, after everything in her life had gone south, after everything seemed to be headed for naught, there was joy. There was hope. There was love. How do we live it? Because each one of us has a vocation, a calling as a Christian to a life of joy and sharing joy. Perhaps it shows up as we sit with a stranger over coffee and listen with, listen with love or bring food to the hungry or visit the imprisoned person or offer personal warmth to the person who feels isolated and alienated by society or a family. All these ways. Joy is the second fruit of the Spirit listed by Paul after love. This fruit comes to us by God's gift rather than something we earn or make happen. So our task is simply to stand before God with awe 
and love and open arms and then to turn and share the overflowing griefs with others. Sounds silly, doesn't it, in our culture? Sharing joy. But how wonderful. How truly wonderful it is to experience sharing, giving, and receiving. How will you do this in your life?